Welcome to part two of the series of conversations, Beyond Einstein, a journey through the enigmatic and awe-inspiring world of gravity. Now, in case you haven't seen it yet, in part one, we focused on dark energy and on gravitational waves. And here in part two, we will discuss the strange and extreme world of black holes. Our story begins over a century ago in the turmoil of World War I amidst the chaos when a German mathematician and astronomer named Karl Schwarzschild, stationed on the Russian front, encountered Albert Einstein's groundbreaking paper on general relativity. Now, despite the unlikely setting, Schwarzschild achieved a monumental feat. He found the first exact solution to Einstein's equations. Schwarzschild considered the relatively simple setting of a perfectly spherical mass sitting in otherwise empty space, and one can easily manipulate the solution he found, making the size of the spherical mass smaller and smaller, and in the math one can clearly see that the resulting indentation in the fabric of space gets deeper and deeper. And at some point it gets so deep that nothing at all can escape the gravitational abyss. Now today we recognize this as the black hole solution a concept so bizarre that Einstein struggled to believe in its physical reality. In fact, as late as I think it was the 1930s, Einstein published papers attempting to prove that black holes could never actually form. However, the tide of scientific opinion began to turn as, for example, Robert Oppenheimer and his collaborators suggested plausible mechanisms for the formation of black holes and mathematical physicist Roger Penrose demonstrated that black holes were a generic outcome of the mathematics of Einstein's theory. But the case for black holes was really clinched by the Event Horizon Telescope, which used a consortium of radio telescopes around the world to image the environment surrounding the enormous black hole in the center of the galaxy M87, which lies about 55 million light years away a triumph of human curiosity and technological prowess. Today, the field of black hole research is advancing far further and at an unprecedented pace, seeking to understand in detail what happens at the edge and maybe even at the center of black holes. And so we are so pleased to welcome two of the field's leading voices to our stage, Aaron Kara and Shep Doleman. First, we have Aaron Kara, who is MIT's class of 1958 career development assistant professor of physics. She uses an innovative technique called reverberation mapping to examine how black holes grow and affect their galactic environments. Aaron, thank you for thank being you. here. And for those of you who are familiar with World Science Festival programs, you will recognize Shep Doleman, who is an astrophysicist at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and the founding director of the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. He led the international team that three years ago produced the very first direct image of a black hole. All right, again, as in the previous chapter, I just want to wind the clock backward a little bit before we get right to the cutting edge. And so we've discussed Einstein's ideas of gravity, the general theory of relativity. And when Einstein wrote down those equations in 1915, equations are meant to be solved. You have an equation describing gravity, but then you want to solve the equation to understand how gravity looks in a given environment. It may be a surprise to some people that Einstein himself did not find the first exact solution to Einstein's equations, right? I mean, it was Carl Schwarzschild, so, and that's vital to the work that you all both do. So, Aaron, just give us a, a sense of what Schwarzschild did and why it's important. Yeah, so Schwarzschild, I think it was even when he was uh, fighting in World War I. Yeah, it was. Um, found a solution to uh, Einstein's field equation, and this represents uh, what we now consider a non-rotating black hole. And, uh, you know, while it was thought to be this, you know, theoretical uh, idea, in the 1960s, they actually uh, discovered that these black holes exist in the universe. And one of the first black holes that, um, that I think people were really um, believed was definitively a black hole 
uh, was a stellar mass black hole that's like 10 times the mass of the sun. It's called Cygnus X1, and it's in a binary system uh, with a normal star. And so it's accreting matter off of that star. Uh, and, and as that material flows towards the black hole, uh, it actually becomes, that, that gas becomes uh, extremely hot and extremely bright. And so in, in, indeed, uh, these, these black holes, these stellar mass black holes, are some of the brightest objects that we see, uh, you know, kind of contrary to the paradigm that we think of that, that black holes are in fact uh, black. And, and that light is coming from the exterior region, which is hot, dense, and intense, and so forth. Now here's, you know, an artist's rendition of this very beautiful image. And as you're saying, there was a lot of indirect evidence for the existence of black holes going through the decades, you know, studies of the motion of stars around the center of our galaxy, the examples that you're given, and so forth. But it was really the work that Shep and your colleagues did with the Event Horizon Telescope that I think nailed the case that black holes are real because like seeing is believing and, and you took some pictures of them. So just give us a sense of, of how you did that. Yeah, so we, we did take a picture of the black hole, the first image of a black hole, but, but LIGO of course heard them ringing. Yes. Uh, but as I like to say, if you're in you know, the wilderness and you hear a bear growl, it's one thing to hear it, but it's another thing to see it and then find out which direction you have to run yep. to get away from it. So seeing the black hole was really uh, what we consider to be the best direct evidence for the existence of supermassive black holes that we know of. And, and we did this by um, levering exactly what Aaron was talking about. When matter is crushed towards the event horizon, it heats up to hundreds of billions of degrees. And that shines brightly. So in a paradox of its own gravity, we wind up with a very luminous object. But the key is that you're so close to the event horizon and the curvature of gravity is so large that the light is lensed around the black hole. Yeah. And even in Einstein's equations, and I think even as early as 1916, the mathematical dimension of that ring that would form around the black hole was known. And we reasoned that if we could make this image, then we could test Einstein's theory at the black hole boundary. And, and we did this by creating an, a global network of telescopes, because they're so small that you need a telescope the size of the Earth to see one. And by linking telescopes around the globe with atomic clocks, pretty easy. <laughs> uh, just a, you take the atomic clock you have in your attic, and you, you bring it to some mountaintop in Chile, and there you go. Um, and we were able to synchronize all of these telescopes, have them swivel to look in one direction at one time, and they were able to form the image that you see. But these are the telescopes you saw the, the image before. And, and when you say the black holes are so small, just to put it in context, they're so far, so they're so small, and therefore we need this kind of a Earth-sized telescope to, to see them. So can we bring up the, the first image? I, I think this is the correct one that you, nope, that's not, is that the right one? Well, that's close to it. That's there, a little bit go. more refined than I was expecting, but fair enough, that's great. And so, so what was your reaction when, I mean, because famously Einstein did not think that black holes were real, right? In the 1940s, wrote papers trying to prove that they were not a real phenomenon, just sort of a mathematical artifact, mm -hmm. and there mm -hmm. you, you have it. So w what was that like? Well. First of all, I want to say that to mount uh, an observation like this takes a whole team and it takes decades to prepare for. So it's not as though all of a sudden one day we woke up and there was the black hole image. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And then <laughs> popped open the champagne. It, it, was, it was failure. It yeah. was developing instrumentation. It was building the team together. It was yeah. taking bespoke electronics to different mountaintops all around the globe. But to see this, really did inspire some awe and humility at the same time. Uh, I'd like to phrase it this way, it was like a hundred year handshake with Einstein. Yeah. Because he's really with us and Schwarzschild and um, Hawking are with us as we make these discoveries. They're just never far yeah. from our thought. I mean, if you go into the blackboard at the Black Hole Initiative at Harvard where, where I spend my time, you'll see Einstein's equations on the blackboard. That's how, All the time. That's how current yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And so to see this 
uh, was a bridge to the past and also kind of an interesting look at what might happen in the future. Yeah, so Aaron, you, you know, somewhat younger than, well, certainly younger than, than, than an old guy like me. What, w what was it like for you? I mean, no doubt you'd been learning about black holes and working with the mathematics of these abstract ideas to actually mm -hmm. see one. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a very impressive day. And, uh, you know, the, the Event Horizon Telescope team, they're very good at keeping their secret image before it was released. So it really was. We were all looking at it together at the same uh, at the same time with the rest of the world and uh, it was it was a really amazing uh, it was better than I even expected it to be. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I work on uh, these 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 black holes and uh, we are, you know, inferring the curvature of, of space time. We're, we're inferring, you know, a shadow like this from the data. Uh, but as you say, to see it in uh, in an image, I think speaks speaks volumes, and it really inspires people uh, as well. And you, Aaron, have been pushing our our understanding of black holes and how we can probe them in unusual ways, mm -hmm. as well as finding ways that the public can experience what it is that you're finding. Mm -hmm. So, can you give us a sense of of your approach, and yeah. maybe we can listen to a little something and then yeah. unpack it and see what we're actually hearing. Yeah. So, I mean, while seeing an image is, um, I think, you know, we all can, can clearly appreciate seeing an image. Um, actually, like a lot of the time when we're doing science, it's not really just the images that are, that are providing us with so much information. Uh, it's, you know, we look at spectra of light, right? Like you saw through that prism. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and we use that to infer, uh, in my case, properties of around the black hole. And so uh, one of the techniques that I'm using is a technique that we call reverberation mapping or light echoes. And what we're doing is we're looking at these black holes with material that's funneling towards them through what we call an accretion disk. Uh, and though we cannot resolve them spatially with our telescopes, especially these stellar mass black holes uh, that I mentioned like Cygnus X1, um, those, are, those are way smaller uh, event horizons than even the event horizon telescope could, could resolve. Uh, and so when we look at those with our telescopes, we see them as a point of light. And the only information that we have about those black holes, uh, about the, you know, the, 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 the light coming from around those black holes, we know the energy of the photon and we know the arrival time of that photon at our detector. Yeah. And so we use that to then uh, you know, measure these echoes of light uh, bouncing off of gas flows around the black hole mm. uh, to reconstruct what it looks like, to reconstruct you know, an image sort of like this. Yeah. And it's sort of like, I mean, just to give an analogy, you have a beautiful little example, if we can bring it up, yeah. using... Uh, so tell us what we just heard. Not what I expected, but tell <laughs> us what we just heard. Yeah, so, you know, what you heard is an echo of light that we have turned into an echo of sound. Um, so, you know, one of the, the ways that I like to explain my research, you know, when I'm talking to students or to my friends and family, uh, is through the analogy of sound. You know, we are all are f familiar with the idea of an echo. You know, I, you hear me directly now, but you're also hearing echoes off of the yeah, wall. Yeah, and you have a nice little example that we could just bring up visually as well. Yeah. You know, I guess it's kind Perfect. of like, is it like what bats do, sort of echolocation, exactly. bouncing sound waves around to sort of get a sense of what a room or an environment looks like? Exactly, yeah. The, the bat knows the speed of sound uh, implicitly, and you know, by, by measuring those echoes, then can reconstruct what the cave looks like. Yeah. And that's exactly what we're doing with light. So the example that you're seeing uh, at the top here is just kind of overlaying uh, a sound echo. You know, this is an example where you hear that direct sound and it's like an impulse, like a clap, right? And if you could track all of the echoes off of, all of those echoes off of the wall, you know what this room looks like. And directly below is an actual general relativistic ray tracing simulation of material around a black hole. And what we've done in this simulation is there's this initial flash of light um, that comes from a region called the corona. 
uh, this hot plasma around the black hole. And that, that direct flash of light then irradiates the inflowing gas as you can see kind of in this schematic, um, and, and it produces this echo of light. So this light is kind of bouncing around this maelstrom of material yes. that is in the environment, and you're able to use the detailed features of all the signals that you get, presumably at different moments in time, because yes. they get different trajectories and so forth, and you can reverse engineer, just like I can reverse engineer an echo in this room to determine how far away that wall is. Exactly, yes. So, right, as you can see here, you know, the, the light that the, from this corona that irradiates very close to the event horizon scales, um, that will have uh, you know, a, a shorter echo than, than the light coming from that's, uh, that's irradiating the disk at very large radii. And then because you know, we know that light's traveling at the speed of light, then we, we use that to infer the, the geometry. And, and, and is this a theoretical idea right now, or do you put this into practice? Have you been actually able We're to actually get... We're actually measuring these, these time delays. And, and, and what have you learned from that? I mean, uh, is Einstein's theory working well in these contexts? Yes, indeed, yes. So, I mean, one of the things that, um, that we're trying to measure are, are fundamental properties of the, the black hole. So, you know, the, the mass of the black hole and the spin, how fast the black hole is rotating. Yeah. Uh, and, and because we can describe, you know, we use these echoes of light to understand the geometry of of that uh, accretion disk, then we can we can say, okay, well, can we see things like um, you know the, the effects of um, gravitational redshift as those photons kind of climb out of that strong potential well? Um, and can, we can you just give us a little sense? We have a nice graphic here. So gravitational redshift, what does that refer to here? Yeah. So you know, if you uh, if you know, basically, as you're seeing on the 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 figure on the left, through flat space time. Um, you know, you would see a, a, a array of light as something blue, for instance. But as that, uh, if you're in curved space time, if you're producing light uh, that is very close to the event horizon and very strongly curved space time, that light is, that, that um, the wavelength of that light gets stretched to longer wavelengths and you see that as a red shift. Yeah. Shifting the color toward the red and that's something that you measure and that allows you to get deeper insight into when that light was emitted and the trajectory that the light exactly. followed. Exactly. So, right. So, you know, that, that the gravitational redshift, um, you know, intimately encodes, you know, where, where is the inner edge of that accretion disk, before, you know, after which things will just plunge into the black hole. And where that inner edge of that accretion disk sits uh, is tied to the, 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 the spin of the black hole. So we right. can measure these fundamental um, black hole properties uh, by measuring things like this gravitational redshift. And so can we go back and just, um, before we actually hear it again, so you gave us an example mm -hmm. where the results of your work was translated into sound. Yeah. What is the nature of that translation? How do you map it? And then maybe we can listen again to get a feel for what's going on. Yeah. So what we've done in these uh, in these in this sonification is, you know, we're looking at echoes. They're they're these signals from around black holes that are delayed in time, but the light is also stretched, uh, yeah. you know, due, due to the curvature of, of, of space time and due to, you know, fun like Doppler shifts uh, because this material is rotating around the black hole. And so what we've done, so we know that the light is, um, you know, being, you know, red shifted or shifted to longer wavelengths. And so what we've done is we said, okay, well, let's just take those wavelengths and, um, you know, put them, you know, to, you know play what they are in a in a sound and tune them to an audible uh, tune them down to an so audible. longer wavelengths of light longer wavelengths of, of sound. sound so it's a, a lower pitch and that's actually one of the things that I really why I really wanted to do this sonification in the first place is you know maybe uh, you know most people don't remember that uh, a red light is longer wavelength than blue light. Maybe that's not something that we really, uh, you know, unless you're living and breathing this stuff every day, sure. you don't really think about, you know, what's the wavelength of, of, of red light versus blue light. 
But you know what we do know is pitch, right? Yeah. You can tell when when a pitch is lower. Sure. Uh, that's yeah, absolutely. You know, exactly. Yeah. Good, yeah. yeah. That's uh, a longer uh, sound wave. Yeah. And so what I think is kind of cool about this is you can hear the general uh, the gravitational redshift uh, because you hear this like if we play it again what you'll listen for this time uh, is there's a do and it's like you you hear this uh, you know the the gravitational redshift the the light from um, closest to the event horizon that has the biggest uh, gravitational redshift and you can hear that as a, a longer all right so our our pitch. challenge right now is to listen for the sound of the general relativistic gravitational redshift that happens closest to the edge of a black hole. Yeah. All right, here we go. Can we hear the sound? I Did think I heard it? it. You heard it? Good. <laughs> Did you hear it? <laughs> yeah, well done. Shep, let's, uh, let's turn to some of the work that you've been doing. You just certainly didn't sit still after you gave the world these first images of black holes. As you said, part of the motivation for the Event Horizon Telescope was to have some means of actually studying as close to the edge, as close to the uh, point of no return, the Event Horizon of a black hole is, would be possible. So where has your focus been? I mean, I have not been following in great detail, but I know that you've been looking at the photon sphere, uh, which is something I learned about in general relativity for black holes, but never really focused my attention on. Well, allow me to direct your attention. To <laughs> Please do. New, uh, I'm shocked that you haven't been following all the latest progress. I've been following um, it pretty closely, actually. I, I, so first of all, I just want to point out that uh, we live in amazing times. Yeah. I mean, this is incredible. The fact that you know, Aaron is doing this work on you know, sonification of black holes and doing echolocation, the fact that LIGO is letting us hear black holes merging, the fact that we can see black holes now yeah. for the first time. Everybody in the audience, you should pinch yourselves, hmm. like literally pinch yourselves right now because we live in an amazing time. And to put it in perspective, Einstein came with the theory of general relativity in 1915. And it, it was years before black holes were accepted, and then yeah. years before they were seen, even indirectly, by astronomers, and then years bef later that they could be measured with precision that we can do now. And now we can imagine very speculative theories, and they're not so speculative anymore. Yeah. We can think about testing some of these theories with great precision. And the, the number of advances that will happen in the future, I think, are, are numerous. Yeah. And they're going to be quite dramatic. So what, you know, the, the, the intellectual palette gets pretty sophisticated pretty quickly. So you know, yes, we've made images of black holes, but what's next? That's yeah. the question we always get. And what we want to do now is go beyond the Event Horizon Telescope, which was limited because we took telescopes around the globe that already existed, and we brought special equipment to them to allow them to create an Earth-sized telescope by operating together in a way that no one of them could do on their own. And now we're asking ourselves, where would we put the next telescope if we had $10 million a pop, which is roughly what a telescope goes for these days, if you're wondering. Like, where would we put them? Would we put them in the Canary Islands? Would we put them in Chile? Would we put them in Mexico? Would we put them in Wyoming? And we've done a lot of simulations to show that the best imaging fidelity comes from a few key locations. Really? And, and how, what, what makes them special, those locations? Just the geometry of the configuration? It, so the way the Event Horizon Telescope works is that we, we fill in this Earth-sized yeah. virtual lens, but there are holes. Those holes limit the sharpness of the image that we can make. It's not the sensitivity. We, we have certainly enough photons coming in, but we miss some of the geometry of this Earth-sized mirror. So by putting telescopes in key locations, we fill in these gaps. And how many did you have for the Event Horizon Telescope? Was like eight or so, was that? We had eight, a few more joined the team, so we yeah. have 11 now. And with this project that we call the Next Generation yeah. Event Horizon Telescope, we want to go to about 20 stations. And sure. since the number of interconnected baselines goes as the square, yeah. 
of the number of stations you have will have you know, quadratically more data points. And, and where do you stand in that? This is the planning phase or? Well, we're, we're planning right now, yeah. and we've had a design program, and now we're in the implementation phase. So we're moving out on that uh, as fast as we can. And what do you imagine you'll be able to do? I mean, if you succeed in having this consortium of 20, where will mm. it go? Well, you know, so, well, so first of all, black holes are still this huge mystery, yeah. right? And so we, we know that black holes can power these extreme jets that come from the north and south poles of a spinning black hole. Uh, there, there may even be a, a, an image of one yeah, that we I can think call we do. up. But the, the, the idea is that we know that these exist. So what you're seeing here is an, in, the, in, the, in like the white color, the optical small galaxy in the center. And then if you look in the radio, which is in the, the, the rose color there, you see these jets that go for one and a half million light years. I and mean, that's mm. incredible. So yeah. something is powering that. It has to be a spinning supermassive black hole. There's nothing else that can convert matter to energy like, like that. So we, we know there has to be a spinning supermassive black hole. Now we want to study with precision how that happens. And to do that, we need to make movies of black mm. holes. So by filling in this Earth-sized virtual lens, we'll go from making still images to motion pictures. And that's going to allow us to test Einstein's theory in new ways, because now we'll be able to see the motions of matter around the black hole, which is different from light bending. Right. Because matter takes different trajectories than light does. So that's one thing. Is it true that, do you have a little simulation of what that might look like? Did I hear correctly that? Uh, I think there's, uh, well, so this is showing on the left a computer simulation of yeah. what the M87 black hole, this first image we made. Yeah. The M87 black hole would look like with the jet streaming away from it. And on the right is what we can do with the next generation EHT, almost a, a copy. So we think that without trying too hard, black hole cinema is going to be coming to a theater <laughs> near you pretty soon, yeah, on the time scale of the lifetime of an astronomer. And you know? uh, who will be playing Shep Dolleman? <laughs> the, the jury's out on that. Yeah, got, the got it. On that. But, but, the, the, but the key thing is, so, so energy extraction from black holes, as, as we saw from that image of, of Hercules A with the jets going away from it, yeah is a big mystery. Another one is, how do we test Einstein's theory with light bending right. closer to the horizon? And these are the light photon rings you were yes. talking about. Um, I think we probably have an animation of that as well. But the key thing is that the big red donut that we saw before is made up of a lot of subcomponents. So most of the emission we see is light that's gently lensed around the black hole. But some light makes a loop-to-loop, -loop, as you'll see in this animation. So some light, which we call the n equals zero ring, is tufty, and it's large scale. Some photons make a full loop-to-loop -loop around, and they are lensed into a thin ring called the n equals one ring. And there's even an n equals two ring where light does a full orbit around the black hole. And as you can imagine, the larger ring depends a little bit on the emission structure around the black hole, it's yeah. the accretion flow. But the closer in you get, the more you're dependent only on Einstein's theories. And so by the time you get to the n equals one and n equals two ring, you can read off things like the spin of the black hole, the mass of the black hole, the inclination of the accretion flow. And these are things we can't do right now. So we're looking to turn these black holes into laboratories. So by capturing these photons that do various trajectories in the vicinity of the black hole, you know, a half a turn, multiple turns, you begin to really have a direct probe of this unusual space-time geometry that is very close to the event horizon. In fact, I don't know if I remember my formulas correctly, but the photon ring is about one and a half times, at least for a non-rotating black hole, mm -hmm. about one and a half times the radius to the event horizon. Mm -hmm. So if here's the event horizon, you're just going a half a radius beyond that, and you'd be probing that directly with this mm -hmm. approach. Yeah, well, well it, it, our precision gets better and better the further in we go. And the, the thing that I find really intriguing about this is that you're looking at photons that have been trapped in multiple orbits around the black hole. And in theory, you could have a photon that has been orbiting this black hole for millions of years. 
right? So you can have many, many different nested rings. They'll be fainter and fainter, thinner and thinner, and they'll all get closer and closer to the true photon orbit, right. that, that one and a half yeah. times the Schwarzschild sure. radius. And the, the, but the closer in you go, the more ancient these photons are. So it's not just a, uh, taking an image to test Einstein, but we're looking back in time in a certain way, using the fact that black holes can trap photons to measure something that's really tangible. So it's a movie in sort of two senses of the term. You can actually dynamically watch things changing over time, but the photons themselves have an inbuilt history because they have been traversing this route along the edge of the black hole for, as you say, for many years, perhaps millions of years. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. And so, you know, I know that you're working with theorists in, in trying to have a wonderful interplay between the mathematical ideas and the observations. Do you anticipate Einstein coming through with flying colors on this, or do you think <laughs> this is a place where the rubber will hit the road and, and Einstein will be great, you know, as you head inwards, but perhaps we'll have to do some modifications. Yeah. So it's never a good idea to bet against Einstein. <laughs> but nobody ever made any money by saying Einstein was wrong, okay? Still, we know he has to be wrong. And GR, general relativity, is one of those interesting theories where from the moment it was born, we knew it had to be wrong somewhere. Because as soon as Schwarzschild came with his solution, and he said, well, what if there's a point mass here? Yeah. And everything is scrunching into a point. We know that the quantum world and the gravitational world have to coexist somewhere, that, that you can't just keep condensing forever. So we know that there's a region that we don't understand. And that's encoded in the DNA of, of GR. But as we think about looking for deviations from Einstein's theory, we want to get as close as we can to the event horizon. That, that's, what, that's what we do in our project. And I think Aaron comes at it from a different yeah. perspective, and you might even come at it from the LIGO perspective. But what we're trying to do is make the highest precision measurements we can of the event horizon, thinking that's where we'll see the deviations. And as an example, there was a postdoc in our group who was working on wormholes. Yeah. These are potential connections between one causal region of the universe and another through a a tunnel, if a you tunnel. will. A tunnel. And these are very speculative. I, you know, we don't use these every day. I don't you know, think about it all the time. But if what we're looking at in M87 could be a wormhole, you might see a ring within a ring. Because the light would go through this tunnel, come all the way back, and you would get the ring of the black hole and then the ring of the wormhole. Wow. And this is something that we can begin to think about now. So I don't rule anything out. We just have to make the best measurements we can. Wow. That is incredibly exciting. When you find that ring within the ring, let us know. <laughs> the World Science Festival will be the first to know. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Join me in thanking Aaron Carr and Chef Dolman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is enormously exciting to imagine where research into black holes will take us in the next few years. To delineate warp geometry near the edge of a black hole through dynamic black hole imaging that captures photons that may have encircled a black hole numerous times before being released, as well as through echoes as light bounces around the chaotic maelstrom activity swirling around a black hole, and to think that these are realms that even Einstein himself never thought even existed. There is another implication of Einstein's general theory of relativity, which Einstein surely would also have not greeted with warmth. And that is the time-reversed version of a black hole, also known as a white hole. We do not know if white holes exist, but in part three of this Beyond Einstein series of conversations, we will take up this exotic, exciting, but surely speculative possibility with the renowned physicist and author Carlo Rovelli.